the one thing I, I identified is that I didn't feel like they were any smarter than I was. They just knew something I didn't. What's going on, everybody? I'm Chris Noggle. Welcome back to the Money School Podcast, where we talk about one thing and one thing only, the truth about money. But along with the truth about money comes, how do you make money? Where do you put your money? How do you get your money to work for you? Well, that's exactly what today's guest is going to be talking to you about, but not in the same context as you've heard with some of the fix and flip folks. We're going to be talking about parking lots. Oh, you heard it. Parking lots and mobile home investing. That's what we're going to be talking about because my guest that's on here today has literally carved out a huge niche in that, about a $300 million niche in this category. And we're going to be talking about it. He's not only a renowned author with his book, The Cash Flow Investor, but let's just bring him on because his story is awesome. From paperboy to electronic <laughs> installer and you know a base man, that's what I would call it from back in the day, right up to where he's at today. And just uh, what a heck a heck of a story, Kevin Bupp. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for having me, buddy. That was that was a great introduction. Hopefully, I can live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you can because you know you started at a young age, you yeah. know, as a paper boy. And gosh, you know, it's I, I look at the kids today. You know, I'm 47. You're not far behind me at 45. But I look at the kids today, and I'm wondering, like, do paper boys even exist? Is that even relevant today with social media? But like. Think about what that did for you, Kevin, like how that molded you at a young age of 12. When you're going out there, you're delivering papers and you're making money doing it, which kind of almost instills that entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. And and it's it's kind of doesn't exist anymore. The lemonade stands, all the things we grew up doing are kind of things of the past. So just let's talk a little bit about your journey from paper boy to multimillionaire parking lot investor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. Yeah, they definitely don't exist anymore. In fact, it was almost being phased out as, as I was uh, going through high school. I, I remember like there was different routes that were just basically getting taken over by Guys in vans, and now there's no guys in vans anymore, right? Newspaper, it's just not a thing. No one, no one really gets it delivered, unless it's maybe the USA Today or something like that. But uh, generally speaking, we're getting all of our information and news online, or we're going to the store to buy a copy if we're one of those folks that still want a physical copy of a newspaper. But but no, but it, it, you know, for me, it was like, you know, Chris, it was all about, I grew up in a great family, you know, middle class, um, didn't didn't go without, but didn't have a lot, right? Like you had all we needed. It was all relative, right? It's all all I knew. But I think for me, like the the, the whole thing was um, just be able to make my own money. You know, there's always when you're a kid, you want the it was back then. BMX bikes were all the craze, right? Like it was like you know the, like the the best thing, and uh, you know, motor cars or dirt bikes or you know sporting equipment, whatever it was. You know, I wanted it. And, and at the, I think when it first clicked for me, I think I was probably seven or eight, give or take. And I lived in Pennsylvania. It snowed there. And um, and and I had a brother. He was six years older. And I was with a bunch of friends in the neighborhood that were both my age as well as kind of my brother's age and everyone in between. And one day we went out after it snowed and we started knocking on doors. It wasn't my idea, but I kind of followed along and we went and shoveled a bunch of driveways and made money. Like literally got paid. It was like five dollars driveway back then, which was still plenty of money. You know, we did like four driveways between a couple of us and uh for me, like that just clicked. I'm like, holy crap. Like, you know, this is like three times the amount of what I would be getting gotten paid in an allowance, right? Like, or, or, you know, over, over the same span of time. And so I could go buy this, that, and the other with this money. It's like, it just clicked at that point of like, I could go do this my own. I don't have to wait until Christmas comes along or I don't have to go beg my parents or or, or, or try to finagle a way to, to get the latest and greatest thing. I'm going to do it on my own. And so it just, I mean, I would mill grass in the summertime. I would shovel snow in the wintertime. And then, you know, it was on my radar. This paper, I think was on my radar. You had to be 12 years old. And the guy that was in my neighborhood that had the route we had, it was huge. It was a big route. He was going, he literally kept it all the way through high school and he was going off to college and I knew it was coming up. And I wrote my, my dad helped me write like a, uh, a personalized letter to the, I forget what you call him, but basically like the area manager that managed like a bunch of paper boys. And, uh, and ultimately I got the job. I landed the job and it was, it was great, man. It was a seven day a week job, literally seven days a week, waking up at, you know, 4 a.m. on, on uh, Sunday mornings. You had to put the newspapers together back there. I don't know if you remember back, there was like the comic section and there's a bunch of, you know, there's seven or eight different sections of the newspaper. But anyway, I think that was for me, yeah, like Kevin, that was before like, before we move past that, I'd be remiss yeah. not to bring up because we're almost the same age. Yeah. The movie yeah. Rad. You oh my God. Movie Rad? Dude, it's my favorite movie. Oh, and I probably I, still watch it like three or four times a year. I seriously do. Because I got two boys. Yeah. They're seven and 10. And I try to relive vicariously through them. And so they, they know shaped. Rad well. 
shaped yeah. us. I mean, like you're talking about being, you know, the paper delivery boy. And that movie literally was the reason that I was wanted it. to deliver papers. I mean, yes. like Crew Jones in the beginning. That's right. You know, ripping through the neighborhood, delivering papers. Like, gosh, if, if any of you watching this podcast have not watched <laughs> or seen the movie Rad, go find it and watch it. And you'll understand a lot more about me and Kevin than you ever could. No, it's amazing. Watching anything else. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's by far my, it's funny you bring it up. up. It's by far my favorite movie. Some, they remastered it like in the last four or five years. And so I own a actual legit, not like bootleg copy of it. Like you can buy it on like prime or something like that. And you can, so you can own a true piece of history, but remastered to where it's not like on a VHS tape where, you know, I don't have a you know, VHS player anymore. So uh, most people don't, but um, yeah, no, it, that definitely, that was it. That was a big high for me and you know i used to try to you know jump off curbs news it it doesn't work as well as what it does in the movie you know what i mean like it's really difficult to actually have a stack of papers in a bag and actually do tricks and do anything other than crash you know if you're trying to jump off curbs or jump off like you know ramps or something like that so but no it definitely shaped my childhood <laughs> and now that we're older if you rewatch it you pay close attention to those early you know where he comes through that yard and does the 360 oh yeah he doesn't have any papers in his in his, no, in his chest. No. there's no papers in there so you know it was a That's little awesome. bit of hocus pocus from that but it was still cool. absolutely yeah, no. So, I mean, that, that was, I mean, that was just for, for me, that was a pivotal moment. And, um, and again, you know, back then I wasn't really thinking about, you know, learning responsibility. I was just like, this is a really good paying job. I'm 12 years old. No one else I know that's 12 is actually making money like this. And I was making like 40 bucks a week. It was a lot, that's a lot of money, you know, for a, for a 12 year old you know, with, with, with inflation. I don't know what that equates to, but it was quite a bit of money um, for a 12 year old. And so, you know, that, that was, I mean, that, you know, from that point moving forward, Chris, I mean, it was just, for me, it was all about, I, like now, like the light bulb moment had already gone off. Like I, can, I can kind of pave my own way. I can create my own outcome. And, and, and it just, it, it snowballed into different things. I, we talked about this earlier. I, I learned how to install car stereo systems when it was cool to have like the, you know, the, the, the loudest bass. Uh, I, I learned how to do that in my, my dad's garage. He taught me the basics and I installed, you know, car systems, uh, amplifiers, you know, sub boxes, all that. And my friend's cars, I made money doing that. And, you know, it just, once I got to in high school, you know, I was I was doing all these little odd things to make money. I didn't really have a full clear picture though of like what what life was going to look like after high school. And I and I really didn't enjoy school. I, I had a hard time focusing. I just I don't learn in a traditional manner. Today, I, like I, you know, years after I graduate, I really learned myself a lot more of how I learn, you know, how I develop as an individual. I didn't really get it in high school, and I also didn't really give a shit about like what they were teaching. I, I didn't know how it was applicable later on in life. And, you know, so I just really didn't, I didn't work that hard. And so I graduated high school. All my friends went away to school. I was like, you know, and I'm not going to go do that. Cause I'm just going to burn my, my parents' money. Like there's, there's no way I'm going to go away. Cause I will literally fail. I knew myself well enough that I would literally party and I would fail out um, within the first semester or two. And so I went to local community college I got a job in Pennsylvania. You only had to be 18 to bartend. Um, I got a, a, a job tending bar at a local um, microbrewery. Really cool job, really cool gig. And uh, and I had fun for like a year, literally going to school, tending bar in the evenings and on the weekends, just having a good time. But again, no real direction of like, what is tomorrow? What's next year? Like, what, what's my future? Like, I, I didn't want to be the loser guy. There was a guy I worked with, and I'm not going to name his name, but in case he listens in here, but there was a guy I worked with at that bar. He was like 40, he was our age basically. And, 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 and I'm not, I'm not trying to throw bartenders under the bus. It's a, it's a great profession. A lot of fun. You make really good money. I didn't want to be a career bartender. He was a career bartender. Everyone thought he was cool. He'd been doing it forever, but really I, I saw past that. I saw some insecurities. This guy literally was in his mind. I could just tell he was at like a dead end. Like, and I was like, man, I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to be that guy. I don't get stuck in, in this uh, hospitality trade and then find myself 10, 15 years later, literally still slinging drinks. Again, nothing wrong with it. It's just not where I wanted to go. But and what so year, um, what year was that you were doing that? Cause I'm trying this to is like, I graduated, I graduated high school in 1997. So I got a, I got a, uh, you know, yeah. So 1998, so 1999. They didn't have um, craft beer back there. So where did this whole craft In the Northeast beer, they did. They yeah. Did. In the Northeast. So I'm, in the yeah. Northeast. I'm in Buffalo. I don't remember anything other than yeah, maybe not blue need, and just some. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So we had, um, uh, I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and it's randomly enough, like in Harrisburg's a capital, but it's a small city. It's not big. I don't know what the population was back then, but it probably wasn't more than a hundred thousand, maybe 150,000 people. And, um, we literally had, uh, within two, um, 
Well, number one, Yingling's from. I mean, everyone knows Yingling. Oh, yeah, so that's yeah, from, yeah. that's about an hour and a half away. So that's not where I grew up, but an hour and a half away. And that's like, you know, America's oldest crap brewery. Um, but we had, I worked at a place called Appalachian Brewing Company, still around today. I think they've got seven, eight locations. Uh, I don't think they distribute down south where I live now. But, um, and there was another one called Trogues, which is still around today as well. And it's really large up in the Northeast. Um, and they're literally like two miles down the road from one another. So we had two really large, prominent microbreweries, like right in my hometown. And now there's probably 20 of them, you know, for all I know. But, um, yeah, so it was a great opportunity. It was like it was a it was a time when the, the craft beer craze was already West Coast. It was kind of a big deal on the West Coast, and it was making its way into pocket areas on the East Coast. And so I just happened to kind of be like on the front tail of that, and and had the opportunity to really experience and, and taste some amazing beers, and just learn the process and be around. You know what, what was a really neat culture. I think today it's kind of diluted. There's so many microbreweries now. I mean, like it's. It's very difficult to find one that's unique and sets itself apart. Back then, it was so unique. It was like its own little subculture, and it was really cool to be a part of it. And I, I mean, literally, it was a fun job. I, I was sad when I finally left that job. I was happy because I was leaving it because I, I was doing so well making money in real estate. But I was sad because I really enjoyed what I did. And I enjoyed the people that came in there and drank beers, all the regulars, things like that. It was just a really enjoyable experience. So definitely wouldn't trade it for the world. I just didn't want to end up like the guy that I work with that literally had been slinging drinks for, you know, 30 years or 20 years or something like that. So, um, and, yeah. And it's yeah, funny but, when you said Yingling, like, yeah, Yingling was definitely prevalent up in the Buffalo yeah. area, but I just never for some reason associated that with a craft yeah. beer, but I guess it really was. And it still is. Yeah. Yeah, back because back then, it, I mean, it, I, you know, I think they they judge it by how many barrels are produced a year, and I don't even know what 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 that formula is. But back then, it was only like you 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 could get it in Pennsylvania, and you could get it in some of the surrounding states of PA, but like it wasn't like mass distributed like it is today. Like pretty much today, you can get it probably in all fifty states, I would right. think. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it just yeah. So I, I was kind of around it, and uh, and anyway, just a r- really fun experience. So I, I don't know where I was going with that, but I guess fast forward is uh, uh, fast forward is like kind of how I found my way into real estate. I again, I was at this point, I was 19 years old, not knowing exactly what the I was having fun, but not knowing exactly number one why I was going to school. Like I was going to community college, just taking general classes, and I was like this is good. I feel like I'm doing something, but I still feel productive because I truly don't know what I'm like aiming towards. Right. And, um, and I, I was dating a girl at this time and her mom had started dating this guy, David, uh, her mom had recently been divorced like a year or two prior, started dating this, this, this guy locally. And I met David and, uh, he was a local real estate investor. Um, he was like 25 years older than I, and, uh, but he owned a number of, uh, single family rentals, small multifamily rental properties. He had been doing it for like 20 years. I mean, he was, uh, and, and you know, I think the thing that stuck out to me with Dave and when I met him was that, um, he lived, he just, he just had a different swagger to him. He drove a, you know, very different car than what, you know, my parents might've dri- driven, drive, or, uh, driven growing up. Um, just always seemed to be around during daytime hours when I thought old people were supposed to be at their job working, right? Like it wasn't a nine to five for him. I'd always kind of see him around the house at odd times during the, you know, during the weekdays. And so I got to know David over a couple of months and, um, and just, he was a great guy. We had great conversations. I didn't really comprehend what he did. Um, I understood he owned real estate and I understand that people rented those units from him and he made money on, you know, whatever the spread might be, but that's about it. Like that was the basic understanding I had. And, uh, you know, fast forward about three months, he invited me to a seminar. Yeah. I don't know. He, he liked me, but I, for whatever reason, I don't know what, I never asked him the question I should have, but like, why me? Like what, 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 what made me stick out uh, in your mind as someone that would va- you know, get value from this, the seminar that you had already paid like $5,000 to go to down in Philadelphia. And, um, but anyway, he, he invited me to go and I attended with him. It was a three day event. You know, Ron Legrand's the guy that was teaching and he's still around today. I mean, he's like old school. He's been doing it for like 30 years. Uh, it was a Ron Legrand event on how to fix and flip houses and how, how to wholesale. And uh, that was the start of him. And I went to that event and my eyes just opened up and it wasn't, I didn't, fully comprehend the business at all. I mean, three days, it was like, you know, being, you know, fed with a fire hose. But what I did comprehend is that there was a ton of other people there that I had opportunity to, to meet and speak with, you know, people that were sitting next to me um, over the period of three days that um, were seemingly really successful and doing well. And they were talking about some of the checks that they had, that they were making, you know, by wholesaling houses or fixing and flipping houses. And, and like, it was mind boggling numbers to me. And the one thing I, I identify is that I didn't feel like they were any smarter than I was. They just knew something I didn't. And um, and that to me was was a pivotal moment in my journey. I'm like, this is it. I can I, I need to be able to wrap my arms around this, but this is it. I don't know how yet, but this is it. And so I got home from that event, super excited. 
but I knew myself well enough that if I actually didn't put some action, um, action forward, I was, you know, a week would go by, two weeks would go by, a month or two, and I'd go back right into the same routine. I'd be having fun tending bar, you know, going to community college, and I would literally, all, all the excitement would just fade away. And so, for that reason, I basically went to David. Dave was a solopreneur. He was an older gentleman. Um, so he, you know, he struggled with certain areas, but he, he's really successful. But like being around just for a couple of months, I identify a couple of areas of his business where I thought I could help him out. And so I went and made him an offer that, you know, I thought he couldn't refuse. And uh, that was basically, let me come work for you for free in between classes and tending bar. I didn't normally go to work until like seven at night. Uh, and I had classes three days a week and I was only taking 12 credits. And so I had a lot of free time during the week. And I was like, let me come help you in any capacity that, that, that you see fit. But I, here's a couple of things I think I can help you with in your business. One was like technology. I watched him struggle to put together a PowerPoint presentation for one of his private lenders one time. And it took him like four hours to do what was the most basic PowerPoint presentation. It should take him like four minutes to do. And uh, I was like, I, I think I can at least help you there. And, and, and I'll help you in any other areas because I just want to be around what you're doing. And I want to hear you talk to folks. And I just, I want to get a better understanding of this business and how I can maybe get into it and buy my first property. And so that was it. He accepted the offer. And uh, for like 14, roughly 15 months, um, that's what I did. I literally went to his, his, his house was, this, or his home office was, you know, his house. And, uh, I'd go there, um, either there or meet him out in the field at a rental or, you know, drop, I'd go drop off leases for him. I'd pick up leases. I'd go to Home Depot, pick up two by fours. If maybe his, you know, handyman or subs like needed something on site, I did whatever he needed me to do. In exchange for that, I got to be around him a lot. And I got to hear him talk with brokers, agents, home buyers, home sellers, um, contractors, you name it. I got to hear him negotiate. Um, I just got to see every aspect of his business. And that was it. That was the start of it. I did that for a year and a half, followed him around. And then I, I bought my first property when I was 20. Um, I used wow. the bartending money I'd saved up along with one of his private lender relationships. And I bought that first property. And that was the the first of, you know, what has turned into quite a bit now over the last 20 plus years. So I'll stop there for any clarifying questions, but that was, that was really the foundation. That was the start of it. And I've been doing it full time now. So like I'm a full time real estate investor in many different capacities now, for, uh, basically from, I guess that was 2019 till, you know, till today. So quite a long period of time. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's, it's an awesome story on how you did that, where you just you said, I'll come do this for free just to be the fly on the wall that can learn that. And I relate, you know, when we had our TV show on HG, uh, we would put on Rias every single month. And there was this one young kid that always came in. He sat right in the front left, never knew who he was, didn't talk a lot, but I knew he was young. And I remember one day after I got done with my talk, I'm getting ready to get off the stage. And there he is standing right in front of me in, in the way of me getting off the stage. And and I said, you know, hey, how are you? He said, my name's Dimitri. You know, I said, nice to meet you, Dimitri. And then he just says it right out of the, out of nowhere. He says, are you hiring? And I said to him, I said, listen, we're always hiring, but we don't pay anything. And he didn't move out of the way. That usually always did it. It usually got him to step out of the way and like, oh, you're not paying, I'm not interested. <laughs> he didn't move. And I said, you know, I said, are you interested? And he said, absolutely. I want to learn. And he didn't leave. He stayed around the campfire. He did kind of just what you did, showed up at the office. I would just literally, I had him filing stuff and I thought for sure, like he's going to get sick of doing this nonsense work. But listen, I had to do this back when I started. I had to learn how to file, how to do bookkeeping, how to track things, how to do expense reports. And I had him doing all of this stuff from spreadsheets and that, and he never left. So fast forward to today, <laughs> like he was 19 then, how old is he? Okay. 24 now maybe 25. He's married and got a, a little boy now, but uh, you know we've become good friends. So now he runs a really big construction company, but he also buys houses and flips them, but also services a lot of other flippers. I mean, wildly successful doing That's millions awesome. of dollars. I love it. His last two flips he did made a hundred thousand each. And listen, it's, it's the same thing you did. And I, I just don't know why more people don't do that. Like there is no better education than getting your hands and feet in the game that way. But nobody, you know, like, you did it the right way. You said, listen, I want to help you. I don't want any money. I just want to learn. Dimitri did the same thing. And listen, like that's only two people's trajectory, but I bet you if you talk to a lot of other investors that have had yeah. similar things, that's the way that people learn because you're either going to spend a whole bunch of money, get coaching and all this, or you're just going to learn from the coach by serving mm -hmm. them. And the best thing you can do for anybody is give them time in their day back because time is the most valuable resource. That's so right. I love that you did it that way. Now, what what year were we at with that when you you had mentioned so that was uh, twenty? That would have been uh, um, uh, two, like two thousand there, right around two thousand. Okay. 
So yep. let's let's kind of talk from 2000, which would have been right around the dot com bubble when that mm-hmm. burst. Because I, I want to hit some recessionary stuff. Because I'm going to hit you with some hard questions as we kind of get into this. Yep. So that was the 2000 dot com recession. So things were a bit repressed, repressed for the next couple of years. So that was a long one, and then they got back. So I want to hear what did you do during that that period of time, mm-hmm. and then I know something happened in 2008. So let's go from 2000 straight up through the the fallout in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I stayed in Pennsylvania for uh, basically another almost two years, uh, ended up moving down to where I where currently reside today down in the Tampa Bay area uh, back in 2002. Um, but, you know, for those first couple of years, I still tend to bar and eat. I still needed, you know, some, some, some income coming in. And just so I can, that first property surely didn't set me financially free. Um, and so I basically, I bought that first property, you know, uh, I, I leveraged a lot of David's resources, but again, like that alone was so worth, you know, what I had given him the, the, you know, the prior year and a half. I mean, just having direct contacts to a number of different subs that were already vetted, that had worked on other projects, that had worked with investors, you know, i.e. David, uh, private money lenders, um, you know, title companies. I mean, like it was, it was all kind of there already, you know, handed to me on a silver platter to a certain degree. Um, and I just leveraged those relationships. And so I ended up buying in the first two years uh, up in Pennsylvania, it was slow, but I ended up buying eight properties. Um, and I, when I shouldn't say I bought, I ended up, wholesaling five of them. I kept three of them as rentals and ultimately sold them right when I moved down here to Florida. But really, I was I was ready for something bigger. And so, you know, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, it was it's, it's a great, great area, great area to grow up. It's beautiful. Um, it just was too small. It was um, it, it's a capital of Pennsylvania, but it's a small town environment. Um, not a lot, not, not a lot of growth was happening back then. I think it's grown quite a bit over the last decade, but not back then. It was just it was very stagnant. Even even the even the real estate values, it was a v- very linear marketplace. I mean, not a lot of appreciation um, would happen year over year. And again, it was just I need to, I wanted to go somewhere where there was more action, more activity. In fact, I used to have to drive two hours to go to a RIA meetup. It was down in Philadelphia. That was the closest one. It was a two Two hour drive once a month to go meet other like minded people. It, d- it didn't exist in our area. Um, thinking back, I should have actually created one. But anyway, fast forward, I moved down to Florida in 2002, and that was really when the fire got lit. Um, down here, you know, much larger city, a lot more happening. Um, and, and Florida was really on a on an upward growth trajectory back in early 2000s before the crash happened. And, and I immediately just got plugged into the local scene. And, you know, one of the first uh, connections I made down here, who is a, just a near and dear friend of mine to this day, uh, was Rod Cleef. Uh, Rod Cleef and his his brother uh, ran a very large single family operation down here, just south of Tampa, down in Sarasota. Um, they owned roughly about 800 single family homes, a lot of multifamily way back then. And I ultimately met them through a transaction, became really close friends with them, and just literally learned how the... You know, how the folks that have that bigger vision, that bigger picture do it, right? Like I was still thinking so small minded of, you know, one transaction and then the next and then the next and the next 20 years, maybe I'll build up enough to be financially free. And then I go look at these guys and they own 800 single family homes, all of which they probably bought in like the last seven years, right? I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, I need to figure out what they're doing. It's ultimately kind of, it's kind of the same thing uh, I did with David. Um, you know, we did a couple of transactions together, but I saw some weaknesses in their business. Uh, they owned a lot of real estate over like an eight uh, eight county wide area. And um, a, a, some of that were the counties north up here in Tampa, and they were really far away from it. They're like two hours away from it. And they struggled up here with like their sales and leasing and their sales efforts, or even just managing subs up here. And so I basically leveraged the resources I had locally, and I offered it back to them. And I just, I made their life easier. And in exchange for that, I learned a ton along the way, and I got plugged into just you know, what was basically a 10x resource of what I had just come from. And, um, and, and that was it. That was a fast track. So from like 2002 until 2008, I ended up with a, I built a portfolio of single family homes, about 140 single family homes, about 350 apartment doors, um, as well as some other miscellaneous commercial real estate. Um, thought I was riding high. I thought all was going great. And then ultimately, you know, 08 happened. Um, Florida was one of a number of markets that were kind of ground zero for it. Um, you know, pretty much every market in Florida, um, you, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, all of California, Las Vegas, like there were some hot markets that just basically went too hot, got too hot and basically cooled off incredibly fast. Basically all of Florida was that kind of fit that bill, at least Tampa, Miami, Orlando, and and probably Jacksonville as well. But, um, and so I went from having, you know, r- roughly a $25 million portfolio to, um, essentially losing all Chris and, and, and 
less less than two years, less than two years, and and a lot of a lot of things uh, contributed to that, but mostly it was just a it was a just a massive decline, not just in values like that was part of it, um, but the other piece of it was Florida was a very different state back then from from an economic standpoint. It was there was so much new construction and growth happening here that there a lot of the jobs were construction based jobs, and so when the building stopped happening, there was no jobs left, and so you had this this mass exodus from Florida for a period of time. And so not only did you not have bodies to fill the units, but you actually didn't have, you didn't have workers either. You didn't like to actually do the work to do the turns. I mean, it became a, a very challenging time where our, our, our vacancy rate went from like what average would, would have been average at like 97 to like below 80% in a matter of a couple of months. And we had a very difficult time refilling units, turning units and getting them back occupied. And that, that just, that, that, that went on for too long to where we just couldn't, we couldn't feed the beast anymore. You know, it went from positive cash flow to negative cash flow, and the negative cash flow, the checks that we we're writing each month were substantial. And it got to the point of like, we're going to be out of money in a short period of time. And at that point, banks, that back then when this thing all kind of started playing out and unraveling, banks didn't, banks didn't know what to do. They didn't have workout departments. They didn't have loss mitigation teams that that would work on loan mods. It it didn't exist. And none of the banks that we had relationships with, they didn't want to hear it. They just wanted their money. They didn't want to do a loan modification. They just wanted their money. And so we essentially had to go on the foreclosure on pretty much the entirety of the portfolio. Um, at least all the single family homes, not all the multifamily stuff. Those were different types of loans. But in any event, went from, you know, again, riding high to practically losing everything over a period of like two years. And so I'll stop there for any clarifying questions, but it was a, it was a rough time. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. The biggest thing I want everybody listening to is you had plenty of rentals. You, you were doing really well for your age. Mm -hmm. I mean, crushing it. And then one event completely out of your control hits the entire industry, the, the, the Great Recession, folks, if you don't know what that is. And it just wiped you out. But a lot of people right now today, I, I feel like a lot of the same things that happened back then are happening now. Maybe banks are a little mm -hmm. stronger. The stress tests are all passing. But real estate's in a major bubble right now. And mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people out there saying, yeah, but there's so much demand. And as Fed drops rates, it makes more people, you know, eligible for mortgages. I agree with all that. But what you just said in there, all that was the same back then, except back then people didn't have jobs. And that is what's happening now. Like the economy is slowing. Job yeah. numbers are coming out and they're not looking good. They're actually going the wrong direction. So when people don't have jobs, folks, they can't get a mortgage. And when people don't have jobs, they have a hard time paying rents, especially at the heightened levels we're at today. So I think the one thing I, I want to ask you, Kevin, but I also want to kind of just go back because you already went through this. It's It's been, you know, how many years has it been since 2008? Was it 12, 13? Doing math in my head. 14, it, plenty of time. It's been a while. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I don't know why I'm not doing the math in my head, but it's okay because I got a train of thought. So here we are. Everything is kind of going along and everybody thinks there's no problems, but folks, there's a recession on the horizon. Literally, we're, we're, we're heading into one hell of a slowdown here and it's all probably going to take form in 2025. So what's different between 2008 mm -hmm. and 2025? You know, there's there's definitely differences. Banks are a little bit stronger, but not on the commercial side. And I know you're a big commercial investor, so we'll get there. But when people think commercial, they think these giant apartment complexes. They don't realize that like mobile homes, parking lots, or any any you know yep. business or any building. Basically, anything on, outside of residential or homes up. is commercial. I mean, to, commercial. to a certain degree, yeah, it could but fall people, into that classification. Yeah, I, I think they all think that commercial is like these big units, you know, or some people think it's five units or more. Commercial is really just when you buy a property in your entity. I mean, that's essentially not a residential transaction. So what are you doing to get ready for what's coming? Since you've already been through it, you already lost it all back then. Like what preparations are you making? Now, I know you're in a completely different world with parking lots and mobile homes, way more recession proof than, than rentals. But what advice would you give the 
investors today that have never seen a recession. Think about it. Like how many real estate investors do you meet in your podcast and in the meetings you go to that have never, ever been through an economic downturn? A lot. Like we have. Yeah. And they're, yeah, and they're not ready. They are not ready yeah. for what's about to happen. So, what what yeah. advice would you give them? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I get asked that all the time, and you know, and, and you know, interestingly enough, um, last year for, for for our business, you know, for Sunrise Capital, my company um, was literally one of the best years we have. And when I say the best years, from a from a new acquisition perspective, we had the biggest buy year that we've ever had, almost one hundred million dollars of new assets. And it was in a time, 2023, not a lot of folks were buying, at least not in the commercial world. Um, a lot of publicly traded companies were pencils down. A lot of, and a lot of it was due to either number one, they were having liquidity crises. They 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 were had other projects that maybe were that, that were were sucking them dry. They needed to create liquidity and, and selling assets at a you know less than opportune time. Um, or they just overpaid, you know, they overpaid, like, I, you know, we saw this feeding frenzy in the last couple of years where folks were just paying whatever, whatever they could to get the deal, um, letting money go hard before, um, before they even did any inspections on properties, you know, like money, hard day one type stuff. And, and we even sold a number of properties, um, in the last couple of years during late, basically late 2020, 2021, 2022, we kind of pruned out our portfolio. And if someone came to me with an offer where I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure out a way how they were getting to that number on stuff that we already owned and we knew better than anyone else because we've owned it for a number of years, then we would exit out of it. And that put us in a really good, really good position come last year. We had a lot of liquidity. We've never stopped uh, distributions to any of our investors when others have, when many other, a lot of others have. And in and, and, and last year, there was a lot of not just distressed opportunities, but distressed situations that that came to the market. So these were properties that were in great locations, great markets, um, and the properties were actually fine. It was mostly just the partnerships that were fractured in one mean in one matter or another that ultimately were forcing them to sell. Some of it was debt maturities. They didn't do the timing right on, on their debt, you know, whatever debt they had in place, and they couldn't get a refinance done in time. And so I guess the, the, what I would what I would say to anyone getting started is, I mean, if, if you're not, if you haven't started yet, um, or even if you are, if, if you've already started, I guess first and foremost, the fundamentals, make sure that you're really clear on like, like what, 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 what defines a good deal for you, right? Like it, it means something different to everybody, but don't ever find yourself in a predicament where you're lying to yourself. I can show you a pro forma and I can make it, make it reflect whatever I want it to reflect. I can make adjustments and I can stretch it one direction or another, and I can make a deal work. I can financially engineer and make any deal work on paper. But really when you get down to brass tacks, like the fundamentals never change, be honest with yourself, be honest with the deal and put yourself in a position where you're going to conserve. It doesn't, it means you're, you're probably not going to win a lot of deals. You might only win one out of every hundred deals that you actually make an offer on, but I can promise you if you're true to yourself, and, and, and you don't go outside that buy box and you stay really strict with your criteria that the deal that you do buy, if you operate it correctly, that you should do really, really well. You should be able to weather uh, a lot of storms that might come your way. Um, and in addition to that, I think just being being flush with cash, right? Like making sure that you set your budgets accordingly. So again, even, even going into COVID, like COVID was a situation where like, everyone originally thought the world was going to end and no one was going to pay their rent. And we, at that point, we had like 3,000 tenants, you know? And I'm like, Oh my God, like what's going to happen here? These, these folks don't pay their rent. Like we're going to be in a really rough state, but that's, that would suck. And if they, if they chose not to pay, they did end up paying, but if they chose not to pay, it would have been really painful for us. But from a company perspective, we keep very low leverage on everything. We don't overextend ourselves, which doesn't necessarily equate to the highest returns for our investors. But what it does equate to is peace of mind and stability in times of instability. Right. And so I would say just be very conservative and also have a bucket of cash available. Make sure that you've got plenty of reserves available in the event of something, you know, like a black swan event, like a COVID or like a recessionary period or a period where maybe you've got a, you've got to offer concessions on your rental units. I was having a conversation yesterday with a guy. I unfortunately got personal money in this investment quite a bit, six, you know, six plus figures. Um, and it's, you know, the multifamily world struggling right now. It just is. And it's not bad operators per se. Um, there's some really good operators that just got caught in a tough time. They got caught in an un unexpected environment where rates rose faster than they've ever risen before and they were not planning on it. It wasn't part of their business plan. And the call I had yesterday was about a deal I'm invested in. It's a really nice, you know, class A, you know, multifamily property in a suburb of Phoenix. Um, and uh, part of the conversation was like, what do you, you know, 
you're, there's a lot of new there's a lot a lot of new units coming to the market. So that's one of the challenges they have. It's not just a debt challenge of where rates are at, but there's a ton of new uh, uh, apartment units coming to the market that were they started being built three or four years ago. Like this year alone, there was like twenty eight thousand new units coming to that sub market, and so that's that's the first problem. But that creates a second problem, which is. Everyone's fighting for the same tenant. Everyone's fighting to, to get the same tenant in their door. And so they're literally having to give eight weeks of concessions now to get people in their door. That's ins- two months of free rent out of the 12 months that they're that they're signing a lease for. That's insanity. The only way that you can actually accomplish, I, I think it's the right strategy given their circumstance, but the only way that he's able to do that is by having the necessary capital and means to carry that. And he doesn't have it. And that's why he's coming back to his, his, his investors to ask for more money because he didn't budget for it. He didn't budget for that black smoke or he didn't set aside enough reserves for a, a you know, uh, you know, a, 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 an event that might you know, just come out of, out of nowhere. Right. That just might, might be an inopportune time and, and catch him off guard. And so I guess having the necessary capital in your war chest to, you know, help you manage through the downtime. I mean, because inevitably, Chris, if I could have, if we could have held on to everything we had in Florida, holy no, shit. No. I mean, like, and it, it, I almost it, went bankrupt in 08 as well. So I, but I it would have, right it would have, you. although I think the move we made was the right move. And the reason why I say that was like, the values really, it, it got hurt so bad. Like the values truly didn't come back to even a break even until like 2014 or 15, right? Like it, it was not like two years later. So it wasn't, a, it wouldn't have been a matter of like, well, just hold on for a couple of years and you'll be fine. Right. Um, it, it took a very extended period of time before Florida really ever got back to a, a neutral point. And now it's like gangbusters. Right. And then COVID like just put rocket fuel behind it. Everyone coming here. And like, now it's literally our prices are like living in California. Um, but probably that was a very affordable place to live. But I guess, so that, that, that would be, you know, I, I guess the advice I would give, like, it's just be conservative. Like you got time on your side, you know? I mean, unless you're 80 years old and you're listening to this and you're just getting started and you need to create like a ton of wealth right out of the gate and, and, and be super successful. But if you're truly getting rolling, you're in your twenties, thirties, forties, you got time on your side, just make, you know, really smart, prudent decisions with the investments that you put your money into. And it's okay to be conservative. You don't always have to over leverage things. You don't always have to try to maximize returns. And if you got investors that are coming to deal with you and that's all they want, maybe they're not the right fit for you. Honestly, like our investors, we really decided to, 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 put, to put a focus on an investor bucket of folks that, that, bring, that come to us. They look for a way for the diversity of their investments. And they're at a point in their life, they've already made their money. They just like, don't lose my money. Give me a good solid return and a great asset and don't lose my money. I'd rather you guys be conservative and not over leverage things and not maximize returns and just know that I'm getting a steady clip every quarter, every month, whatever paycheck in my mailbox and that you guys are preserving my my wealth that I've created. Like that works for us and that works for them. And we're not hitting home runs. We're hitting doubles, right? And so find out what works for you and then stick with it. You st- st- Stick true to yourself. Kevin, that's great advice. I, I mean, being liquid and having that that reserve account, that's critical. I mean, that's one thing that, you know, I've been telling everybody is like, this is the time where you get your your leverage down, like you get your debts paid down as much as you can and you get you sit on cash. But it's a hard thing to say when they're looking at the markets and they're saying, oh, markets are at all time highs. Everything looks like it's going good. It's it's all a facade. It's all just a, a fake front. And absolutely, you know, you're the things you're talking about are the same things I'm seeing. I'm seeing syndicated and I'm seeing a whole bunch of real estate investors literally oh, hanging pain. on by a thread and it's not going to get any better. It's a matter of fact, going to get worse. But then all of a sudden, the, everybody's raving right now because the Fed on the 18th dropped rates half a percent, which I thought was an aggressive move. And they think, you know, a lot of investors are thinking, oh, we're saved. Like that's going to, it's, it's not no. going to save you. It's but actually, that didn't even change anything. That was already baked in. Anything. I don't think a lot of people don't realize that. I see a bunch of realtors making posts. And I'm like, oh, like, it's that, insane. That, that, you're creating like this false. So like, you must not even understand how this works. Like that has no correlation. I mean, it, it does to a certain degree, but it, it's right. Rates aren't dropping by a half percent. Thirty year mortgage, what are what most people are looking at? Like they're oh, like, can, already, can I afford the house in. now? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's it was right. Already yeah, built in. The market's built in a quarter percent, you know, well before the Fed dropped rates, and then they came out half a percent. The market digested it and made some slight adjustments. It's not going to save anybody. And the, yeah, the Treasury's ticked percent, up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Oh gosh, it's just you know, the problem you know, is we've been in such a long bull run 
that so many folks have forgotten what that that negative side of this is. And, yeah. you know, and I think that's the danger. But I don't want to spend too much more time on that. I, I know you cover a lot of this in your book, Cash Flow Investor. Um, so, folks, you know, make sure you check out his book, you know, and that's where I want to move next. But I don't want to leave one really important thing out. There's something very unique about you, and that is your family life. And, you know, like we can talk money and all these parking lots and mobile homes and all these units and all this stuff. That's all great. But none of that matters if you don't have mm -hmm. things at home in place. And you do. You met Joanna right. in 2010. You got two boys, which is awesome, Jackson and Julian. Like, I want you to spend a second talking about not just what that piece of your life is like, but also your desire to constantly push yourself at 45, I'm 47, and I do the same damn thing. And it sucks every time of like, you, you're out there doing triathlons, you're, you're doing 100, 200 plus mile bike rides for charities. Like, that stuff is so vital and so often overlooked that I want you to just spend a second talking about the family life and your desire to stay at a peak physical and mental state and what that means for your business. Yeah. I mean, I'll start with the, I guess the health part. I mean, for me, it's, it's just, you know, having, you know, hopefully never ending energy. Like I surely get tired here and there, but like, I want to, I want to be present and, and be, you know, um, um, at my best capacity when I'm with my wife or with my kids or we're out with friends, whatever we're doing, like, I want to have the energy to do it, you know? And so like, I have a fear. I had a fear when I had kids. I'm like, I don't want to be the old guy at school, like the old dad that like literally can't <laughs> like, you know, go, you know, go, go throw football at the sun or, or like help out, like, you know, be a coach or be an assistant or whatever. Like, they, they can't physically be involved with sports because I'm old or I'm fat or I'm overweight or I just I'm in poor shape. And you and I both see fathers and again, I'm not, not putting them down, Every but day. we see that. Yeah. It's sad, man. I, and I actually feel worse for the kids They're than I do for the individual. Right. Yeah. And I feel bad. I'm like, okay, well that's never going to be me. So for me, it's more probably more driven by like a fear of like, you know, being viewed from that perspective and also not being able to show up for my kids and my family like that, 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 that alone pushes me to to keep striving and, and to stay healthy and stay physically fit. Um, you know, as far as the, uh, um, I guess the, the best way to approach this with like, for, for me, like building a business, it's always been about like, so, so like I love mobile home parks. And I do think that we make a really positive impact on the affordable housing space. Like we offer a product that truly, I personally feel, this is not like a sales pitch. I truly feel like it is the best product to help solve the affordable housing crisis. Unfortunately, municipalities don't like new mobile home parks to be built. And so, you know, we're, we've kind of got a brick wall that we have in front of us, but the communities that we do own, we go and we clean them up. We bring new, brand new units in. And, and basically we offer units in any community that we own uh, parks in that are typically nicer and up to like 30% less than what a comparable apartment unit might be. And, and like, you know, three X less than, than what a stick built home might be even on the lower scale. And so I really feel rewarded about the asset class we're in, but at the end of the day, it's an investment vehicle. I mean, it truly is. You know, mobile home parks, it's an investment vehicle. If it didn't make money, I can honestly say that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be investing in it, right? Like it's gotta, it's gotta make economic sense and we gotta be able to build a business from it. And if it doesn't make money, you can't possibly do that. And the reason why I build the business, why I built this business is so that I can buy the time back, buy my own time back and have the you know freedom and flexibility to spend time with, with my sons and and with my wife and, and, and go travel. You know, we travel quite a bit. Like we just love creating experiences and like, there's just no way I would be able to do that. Um, if I didn't have this business, but more importantly than that is, you know, you asked the question of like, why do I keep driving, driving, driving? One of the things for me is I, I found a pivotal moment when I rebuilt the second time around. Yeah. I hit the second I, and I hit it before, but I, I, you know, hit this pivotal period of time where like we were doing really well earlier on with the rebuild kind of phase two, um, doing really well, making money, you know, make, making money after not having money for many years. Um, and it felt really good, but you know, you get to this point of growing your business where, you know, it's kind of, you had, it was myself and one other partner. Um, but it was just us literally doing everything. Then we hired one person, but even then we're like, oh, shit, like we're at the point now, like we're stretched so thin. We're all wearing so many hats. And it's that pivotal moment of like, I've got to, we've got to hire, we really need like three more people, but we truly can't afford those three people. So we got to figure out a way to to fund those folks coming on board because otherwise we're gonna instead of working seventy hours we're gonna have to work ninety hours this week right like and like now we're just trading our time for dollars and like that's not why we're doing this right like this is not fun I'd rather go work somewhere and work a nine to five and know that I at least get the evenings off and the weekends off right if that's what this is gonna be and so we got to get this build this company to the size to where we can start affording not just to hire the necessary 
team members, but to really like, th th that's the first step of it. But the second step is, which is where we're at now. And, and we really got there in like the last two years is, is build it to a scale to where not only can you hire the necessary like admin and just, you know, general team members, but also, you know, the, the, you know, the, the executives, like an executive, like a C-level um, suite of executives, of folks that are truly smarter than us in every capacity, capacity of the business, right? Like we brought in a formal CFO a couple of years ago, um, you know, a formal COO that, that has got 20 plus years experience and, and does his job better than I could ever, you know, you know, do it, even if I focused on it full time, right? And so now with that being said, with those right folks in the organization, the right people on the bus, literally the right people on the bus that are all striving for the same thing and, and they're the best at what they do. That's why I keep driving the business is because that the more I drive the business, the more freedom and flexibility I get on the backside and the more rewarded I get on the backside, which is why we're doing it in the first place. Again, to me, that freedom and flexibility is really focused almost entirely on family. Like that, that's where I spend 98% of my time, um, you know, when I've got free time outside the business, it's with the family and with my kids. So, so um, I don't know if that so answers your question, Chris, but like, does, that, like it, that, that to me, if we, if I didn't keep driving the business, we would never have gotten to that point. And then you find yourself as a business owner, that's, you're just an employee of your business at that point. Like you haven't gotten to the scale to where you can start removing yourself away from the business, right? Start thinking about the bigger vision of the company and, you know, working on the business, not in the business. Everyone's heard that terminology. And the only way you get there is when you start, you can actually afford to bring people in, but you can't afford to bring those people in that are making two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year compensation. You can't bring them in unless you have a certain scale and a certain amount of revenue coming in to, to actually pay them. So. hundred percent. Well, I want to kind of close this episode down by talking just a little bit about your core business today. I mean, we, we've covered a lot of ground from you know, when you were a little boy, right up to, you know, here where you're wildly successful, but why parking lots and mobile homes? <laughs> and now, yeah. now just, just so the audience knows, these are two very recession proof parts of real estate, like the, the or, uh, sectors in real estate would, I guess, be the way to say it. So mm -hmm. number one, it, Kevin and his company is very well positioned, you know, to go into the recessionary period just simply by these assets that we're going to be talking about. But how did you, I mean, it's not sexy by any stretch. I mean, it's not <laughs> class A not apartment all. buildings. Nope. We're talking about parking lots and we're talking about mobile homes. And I grew up where my grandparents lived in a mobile home park their entire life. I spent most of my childhood riding my BMX back in those rad days around the mobile home park. And that's where yeah. all my friends were. So I, I lived the life and it wasn't terrible, but you know, it's just got a negative look at it today. But I'll tell yeah. you, once we go into this next phase, this, this slowdown, <laughs> mobile homes will become very popular. So let's just talk about, real quick about yeah. parking lots and mobile homes. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, quickly how I stumbled across them. I mean, you know, just, I don't, I don't have a, a glamorous story of how that occurred. You know, the mobile home park thing. Um, I ran into it back in, in 2011. I was, I, I kind of went on this, this exploratory mission. Like I was, it was three years post 2008. Um, I was in horrible financial health and, and shape. I mean, like literally, it, you know, negative 500 or, or five, you know, 480 credit score, or whatever. It was really, I didn't even look at it for like six or seven years. It was so low. It was so bad. Judgments out the, out the wazoo. Um, you know, literally just had what was in my bank account, like couldn't get credit cards, couldn't get anything. It was just a really tough time. So, but I went on this exploratory journey, not to only look back and say, what do I need to do differently next time around? So this doesn't happen again. But also, you know, in 2011, the, you know, three years post 2008, the real estate landscape was very different. You know, you got those like, like, like I was like that were just shrapnel, right? Like they were just like, you know, off in the battlefield wounded, you know, a lot of them dead. But then you had some of these new soldiers that kind of came in and, um, and and started buying real estate. And but the world was very different. Lending was different. Um, the real estate market was still like it, it hadn't even started recovering yet by like 2011. It was still in the crapper. It, it, it pretty much across the country. It was in the crapper. And and uh, during this exploratory mission, I met a guy by the name of Randy uh, through a mutual friend. And, and my buddy's like, hey, man, why you just got lunch with Randy? He's a cool guy. He's a retired banker. He banked uh, commercial real estate for 30 years. And uh, he didn't tell me that he owned mobile home parks. But he's like, just go meet him. He's a really cool guy. Go guy. He's local. And uh, he's, you know, a wealth of, of, of knowledge. So I met with Randy. And long story short, Randy uh, was in the commercial banking space for the last 10 years of his career. He was lending mostly on um, manufactured housing communities, mobile home parks here in Florida. and he realized within a couple of years of doing that, that he was on the wrong side of the PL. 
<laughs> he's like, you know, doing, you know, either acquisitions or refinances. He's like, what am I doing here? Like, and so he vowed to, when he retired, that he was going to go buy for retirement. He was going to go buy a couple mobile home parks here in Florida. And that's what he did. So I had lunch with him. Didn't know anything about mobile home parks. I'd never considered the asset class, but he sold me in a two hour lunch meeting of all the great benefits of mobile home parks and why I should start focusing on that and forget about apartment complexes, forget about single family homes. And again, at that point, I was trying to figure out what's in phase two going to look like for me. And so he got me so excited. Um, you know, uh, for, for many different reasons that I left that lunch meeting and I kind of vowed, I was like, in the next 12 months, I'm gonna go buy a park. One way or another, I'm gonna figure out how to buy a park. And it took me just a little bit longer than that. Um, but I bought the first park up in Atlanta. It was REO, um, completely vacant. I mean, completely, it was rough, great market, but really rough. Again, things were still in bad shape back then at that period of time. But, um, Took one of my private lenders that I had, uh, you know, that, that we uh, had from years past. Uh, he came in and helped us uh, uh, finance a deal. Myself and one partner bought it, you know, renovated. It was a 34 space mobile home park, bought that. And um, and everything that Randy told me kind of came true with that one. We stabilized in about eight months. The thing was cash flowing uh, like crazy and um, did a cash out refinance in like the next eight months, got all of our money back out. And, you know, it's still basically pay us like a hundred grand a year, you know, after debt service and expenses. And I'm like, we need to go replicate this. So anyway, like for no other reason, other than someone told me about that asset class. And I just said, I I need to go either prove or disprove all these great things that Randy said about it. And uh, we did, we went and bought one then we bought the second and then bought the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So, you know, there's some uniqueness about mobile home parks though, that I think I should mention, because it's one of the things that really piqued my interest when Randy and I were having that discussion. Number one, it's the only asset class that has a diminishing supply, meaning that there's more that are being torn down or shut down than new product coming onto market every year. Most of that, it's, it's for two reasons, two reasons only. Number one is the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard. You know, municipalities say they want to fix the affordable housing crisis. Um, but when it comes down to it, you know, no one wants to, you know, have their stick built neighborhood back up to a mobile home park. And so for that reason, you know, the voice of opposition typically always wins. And very rarely do you ever see new mobile home parks get built. And if they do, they're like out out in the country, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and the second one is from a tax basis. It, it, it is just about any other type of development on a piece of land would yield the uh, the municipality better tax benefits, tax revenue than that of a mobile home park. You know, they could put apartment complex there, retail shopping center, anything else would 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 benefit them more than that of a mobile home park because the tax base is low. It's really just you know, it's it's slightly improved land. But really, you know, the homes on them, it's not real property. And those homes are just paying registrations on an annual basis like a vehicle might. And so the, the actual real property tax basis is fairly low in comparison to that of a, you know, comparable size development of any other type, um, but not mobile home park. So those are the two reasons. So anyway, and that, that was attractive to me. I'm like, I like this. I like the barrier to entry. I like the idea that I can go buy a park in any good market and know that no one's going to be able to build one right down the road for me. I'm like, that is that's magical, you know, like exactly. literally like it's like a built in brick wall and like, you just don't have to worry about it. And so to this day, we've owned, I don't know, over 50 parks and not once. And, and we own them in 18 different States. I mean, I never once has anything ever been built <laughs> remotely close to, to any of our existing communities. And that's, that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So. That is a beautiful um, thing, man. I, and I know a lot of folks, you know, that are in the mobile home business. Yes. It's, you know, those, those service calls can kind of be annoying, you know, but uh, it sounds like you did it the right well, way. Well, we don't own most of them. Yeah, oh, we don't own right. most of the homes. You just own the land and then they bring the, the unit. Okay, yeah. so you're doing the That's lot, right. right. Yeah, so we own we own the entire property. We own the, you know, the roads and the infrastructure, water line, sewer lines, um, you know, clubhouse, common areas. And for the most part, there are some communities where we own some units, but generally speaking, the business model uh, as a whole is, you know, the, the, the resident, they own their home, just like a homeowner, a regular homeowner. If a roofing goes bad, if the plumbing leaks, if the oh, AC goes yeah. out, like that's them. Like they're calling, you know, the local tech to come and fix it. And they pay us ground rent, you know, for the, for the land their home sits on. And uh, that's it. We maintain the, the common areas and infrastructure and uh, it's a beautiful thing. So it's a lot less management intensive uh, on the operational side than that of a, uh, of a, of a mobile, of a, of a multifamily property. And on, on top of that, the residents are really sticky and it, it, most of our mobile home parks live and breathe like a normal stick built subdivision where like you can, you find residents that have lived there for generations, like literally 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We've got folks in some of our communities that have been there more than 50 years. And we got some communities that have multiple different levels of family, you know, of the family tree living inside the community. Right. And so it's, it's like their own community within our community. And, um, and, and that creates sticky residents where like they don't come and go like they might in a rental unit, like they don't leave every 12 to 18 months. And if they do want to leave, most of the time what happens is they put their home up for sale. 
you know, they continue paying their lot rent to us. Someone else comes in, buys their home. They take over the responsibility. This new person takes over that lot rent responsibility. And we never actually see a, a blip on our income. It is keep paying because the, the, the mobile homes are so costly to move. And so very rarely do these homes ever, once they get ma- once they get moved into a community, they get tied down and blocked. They're, they're, the single one costs about 10 to 12 grand to move somewhere else, right? And it's, it, they, the cost benefit analysis typically is not in the favor of moving that home to another community or to another area. So most of the time they just sell it and then move if they, if they want to go somewhere else. Um, so it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful yeah. business. And for many other ways or other reasons as well, but like it's, it's, it's been great to us. We've really enjoyed it. And um, it's just been a fun asset class. And Warren Buffett also loves that asset class. Yeah, absolutely. So, he does. <laughs> so Kevin, this has been great. And you know, we've kind of got to the end of this, this episode, but how do people learn more about you? Where, I mean, can they grab yeah. your book anywhere? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll give a free copy. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll share a link. Uh, they can get on Amazon. I think it paid 20 bucks or you know, $20 for it. But if you go to kevinbuff.com forward slash free book, you can actually get a free copy, physical copy. Um, you have to pay the shipping handling. I think it's either $5.99 or $6.99, but you get the you know physical copy sent to you. Um, as far as learning about me or getting in contact with me, you know, if you want to learn a little bit more about what we're doing over at Sunrise Capital, um, both in the mobile home park and parking space, you can go to investwithsunrise.com. And we've got a lot of cool things on the website. We have a current offering open so you can read about that and learn about just what we do day in day out but also we've got a lot of uh, other historical information that we that we post on the website we're pretty transparent about deals that we either currently own or have historically owned we put appraisals up third-party reports we, we give kind of a synopsis of the business plan what part of the what stage we're in of the business plan of, of turning around a property or you know adding value to a property and so you could probably learn something there as well if you have an interest in kind of the two niches that we're in you can learn a little bit more about those two niches by going to that website. And, um, and I guess lastly, Chris, um, I do host a podcast as well. It's called real estate investing for cash flow. Um, been doing it for about 10 years, a little over 10 years now. So quite some time. And, uh, it's, it's mostly a commercial real estate based show. Uh, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you download your, your podcast. Um, but you can either, you know, go there or you can go to kevinbuff.com, my website and, uh, and let's do it there as well. So Love it. with that, I've got a really unique last name, Chris. So if you go to anywhere on social, I mean, just type in Kevin Bupp. Like, there, I don't. I truly don't believe there's another Kevin Bupp in the world. Maybe, um, but probably, probably not one that's actually also in real estate. So you shouldn't be having too hard of a time tracking me down. Well, folks, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put all those links. So it was Kevin Bupp b u p p dot right. com slash free book, and then the other one was Invest with Sunrise. Did I get that right? That's right. Invest with Nailed Sunrise. It. We'll put those links in the description so you can click them, check them out. And yeah, Kevin's not going to be a hard guy to find with a name like that. But uh, Kevin, <laughs> thank you so much for joining Chris. And, and sharing your story. Yeah, it's been awesome being here, buddy. Thanks for having me over. Absolutely. Well, folks, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Money School Podcast. We'll see you on the next one.